Welcome to Glass Half Full or Empty, Illuminating the Human Transcriptome. You may not quite know what the word transcriptome refers to at this point, but this lecture will hopefully clarify that one particular concept. We will try and define within the course of this lecture what we are exactly studying in this course. And I'll start with a rhetorical question. What is the world? When you hear a particular abstract word, such as world, you can imagine many different cartoons and schematics, such as the one shown on the screen. Or perhaps a more realistic image with weather, weather patterns, a photo taken from space, perhaps. Or you can imagine the neighborhoods and avenues where you live, where you work, where your culture is. All of these are encompassed by the abstract word world and by the concept of the world. What is the world? Well, if we continue with the space metaphor and we look at the course as designed, it looks at things from two very particular points of view. In this lecture, we'll spend some time in the exosphere, sort of like that satellite image, and try and gain a very, very high level overview of the most relevant concepts in biology necessary to understand this course. But as we practice it, and as the lab work later suggests, we're looking at a very specific research problem. And this example, we hope, will generalize to your other pursuits if you choose ever to perform biological research or research in any other disciplines. That being said, as we arrive at these later points in the course, you'll see a lot of alphabet soup, protein names, RNA names. You may not know what protein and RNA are, but basically there's like 20,000 of them, 30,000 of them, maybe hundreds of thousands, depending on who you ask, and they all have various names and such associated with them. There's no need to memorize every particular name. It's more of when you see a name, do you know that it's a protein? Do you, can you recognize it as being associated with these high-level concepts that we're going to be going over? And then later in the course, we will go look at the strategies and methodologies for studying these lower-level details. So, that begs the question, what is the world of biology? And it's certainly not as big as Earth. The world of biology, as we imagine it, focuses on the cell, which is completely defined as the most sort of singular unit of life. One cell is living, half of a cell not living, because it can't sustain all of the functions of a cell. It can't eat, it can't reproduce. If it's only half a cell, it can't do all of the other things that we typically associate with life. I won't speak more to that point because defining whether an organism is living or not, or whether a virus is living or not, or whether any of the other things you've heard about associated with biology are living or not is outside of the scope of this course. But the cell, that's our unit. And we're gonna imagine it as having two components a nucleus shown in purple in the middle, and a cytoplasm. The nucleus contains all of the DNA of the cell. The DNA is transcribed, is copied into RNA, and that RNA is converted within the cytoplasm to protein by another molecular machine called a ribosome. RNA, proteins, generally exist in the cytoplasm, although RNA is originally produced in the nucleus and moves across from the nucleus into the cytoplasm to be turned into protein. And some proteins migrate back from the cytoplasm into the nucleus to help with the general functioning of the cell and to perform all of the different operations. Again, the cell is our unit. And here's you know a little bit more of a complex schematic. 
As you can see, there's all kinds of other structures. Those are called organelles. For now, just focus on there being a nucleus and a cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm contains everything else. The nucleus contains DNA. That should be suitable. So what exactly is this DNA? Well, I've put a, a schematic here. This is the classic double helix. Let's examine that a little bit cl more closely. If you look, it seems like there are colors or rungs arranged in a certain order. We could imagine that as being from top to bottom, or from bottom to top, or however we'd like, but there is a particular order. This green base is always above this red base, and this red base is always above this pink base. The key is there is an intrinsic order within the DNA molecule. And this intrinsic order provides key information about this living system or the DNA that this living system is a part of. Here's a more specific definition of what these different colors actually mean. They refer to the four base pairs of DNA, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, typically abbreviated as A, T, C, and G and they exist on this backbone. Now let's imagine that we only look at one of these strands, the turquoise strand in this example. What we can do, as I mentioned, is follow along the rungs that attach to this particular backbone and find that the DNA has some intrinsic order. In this case, we see that there's first an adenine, then a cytosine, then a thymine, then this base seems to be hidden. We know that it's a cytosine actually because it's across from a guanine. We'll recapitulate that rule in a minute. Thymine, guanine, adenine, etc. And we get the sequence shown in turquoise. And as you can see, this is the way this translates through. Now it's your turn. Try out the same approach with the red sequence. I will pause. You can pause the video in order to try it out yourself. All right, welcome back. Here is the sequence as shown for red. And now I'm gonna superimpose that onto the sequence that I originally showed in turquoise. And this makes clear that there is an association between the base pairs on one rung with the base pairs on the other rung. Namely, that adenine always pairs with thymine and that cytosine always pairs with guanine, as shown. I will attach a worksheet in the description where you can practice these complementary base pairing rules. All right, moving along, we've referred to the DNA in the nucleus. We've shown the structure of DNA and we've shown that DNA is composed of four base pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. We collectively refer to all of the DNA in the nucleus as the genome. And this genome, you can imagine it as containing the avenues and the streets and all of these different local components within it, millions of them millions of streets, millions of avenues, millions of neighborhoods that all interact with each other in complex ways to perform all of the different functions of life. And what we're now going to do is look a little bit more at how these avenues and streets are organized so that we'll be able to recognize them later in the course. 
as I showed in the previous example, we can take the DNA in a certain strand and convert it into a listing of base pairs. We can do that for all of the DNA within a, within a cell's genome. And once we do that, we find that there are over 3 billion base pairs within the human genome, within a typical person. Quite incredible. But it's just extending the concept that we just reviewed. The question is, if you have 3 billion base pairs, how can you access a particular location? Or how is it particularly organized? If you had to start from, you know, base pair 1 every time, it might take a little while to get to base pair 2.5 billion. However you imagine it. Well, you know, the DNA is really floating around in, in 3D space, so it's a, little, it's a little easier to access. But when a cell is dividing or when a cell is replicating, the DNA um, condenses into these chromosomes. It's always organized in chromosomes. Usually it's just floating around loosely, but during division, they condense into these chromosomes as shown here. There are 22 somatic chromosomes. That means um, regular, everyday chromosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes that determine the biological gender for a particular uh, individual cell. So you have these collectively 23 chromosomes and there are two copies of each chromosome within the cell. So you have this collection which is basically very well visualized during the division. That's why we have this visualization here. And these conveniently happen to provide excellent markers of location. So if you wanted to find a particular DNA within chromosome 1, you could organize it from the first base pair to the last base pair of 1. And of course, you only need to look at 23 because there's two copies of each instead of looking at 54 different possible locations. So we can access particular points within the genome by first referencing the chromosome and then referencing the coordinate. So for example, chromosome 1 has all of these base pairs, chromosome 2 all of these base pairs, chromosome 3, sequence of base pairs, some are shorter, some are longer, in total 3 billion, we can access them with a particular location. And scientists do this by utilizing the UCSC Genome Browser. The Genome Browser, as you can see, allows you to simply put in a position, a location. You can hit Go, and you can go directly to that chromosomal coordinate. Now, you don't need to understand what all of these particular tabs do and what all of the information is that is contained. This is the neighborhood. It's the butcher. It's the coffee shop. It's all of these different sort of components that are necessary in order to regulate and have a functioning neighborhood. Right now, all of the intricate details don't matter, but what is important is that you can access particular locations in a very specific and defined manner. Returning back to an example from the human genome, let's just take a simplified schematic of one of these neighborhoods, certainly more simple than what we saw in the genome browser. We have here a reference sequence of DNA that I'm going to convert from its base pair format into just this line to simplify the further drawings. We're going to say that there's a particular neighborhood or a particular gene in one of these locations or within the location between those two yellow bars. We're going to call this gene chat. And it has this sequence. You can, you know, remember that the line represents this sequence. That's chat. Now we ask Google or we ask somebody, what is chat? And we get that 
the this is chat. This is what the Google result or the social media search or whatever else we use pops up with. This is chat. It looks like a protein and we have it here spinning around. And the question is, well, the, the neighborhood here, that was represented as chat. But when I Google it, when I look it up what it is, I get this yeah, pretty picture. Why is there this difference? Or how did we get from one thing to the other thing? Is Google wrong? No. The way that this converts from one particular portion of the genome or one particular stretch of DNA to this protein that we actually call chat or that we actually call by its name is through the central dogma of biology which states that DNA is transcribed or copied into RNA which is then converted into protein within the cytoplasm and then a lot of those proteins end up staying in the cytoplasm. Some go back to the nucleus, most stay in the cytoplasm and then carry out a particular function. In this case, I don't even know what the function of chat is. What's important to recognize here is that DNA is converted to RNA and then it, that is converted to protein. And that is how we get from this particular reference sequence to this particular product. Now we're going to look at that process in a little bit more detail, specifically by focusing on this question of what RNA is. So what is RNA? Here's the same schematic as before with DNA that we were able to convert into an organized sequence of base pairs. RNA similarly has an intrinsic order and it shares most of the base pairs with DNA such as adenine, cytosine, and guanine. The only difference here is that thymine, instead of thymine bases, you have uracil. In terms of structural organization, as you note on the left, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. It has two strands and the bases are usually complementary, well, they are always complementary and they are, and DNA is usually found in this double-stranded format. RNA is by and large found in this single-stranded format as shown on the right. It exists as a single strand that maintains the order of the base pairs, but there isn't a complementary strand which would provide further information or make it easier to copy the RNA. However, the fact that RNA is single-stranded means that it can make all kinds of funky structures. So it exists as messenger RNA. Messenger RNA or mRNA is the RNA that was referenced on the previous slide as being converted into protein. But it can also make this funky loop structure. This is actually necessary in order to transfer or get the building blocks of proteins to the particular ribosome. And even in the construction of the ribosome, there's just RNA that helps to maintain the integrity and structure of the whole product. And so, as you can see, RNA, due to its single-stranded nature, is certainly much more capable of making these diverse structures and functioning in many ways that are much more diverse than what you would typically find for DNA. One particular application is that it is, is, is alternative splicing, which is involved, which is the process that we're going to next discuss in the context of chat. So this diagram just shows that I'm in terms of the reference sequence, I'm expanding in and I'm specifically going to look at just this chat region. What happens, as I mentioned, is that the chat DNA region is copied word for word, or letter for letter, I should say, into chat RNA. And as you can see, there's the chat RNA in gray. Particular sequences particular combinations of letters are typically associated as splice signals. 
So this means there are proteins and RNAs that recognize that particular sequence and then can cut out a piece of the RNA. This process occurs probabilistically. So there might be a 40% chance that this first segment gets cut out, a 60% chance this segment gets cut out, and a 20% chance that this segment gets cut out. Between these probabilities and between this large RNA, what we get, perhaps, if we were to cut all three of these out, is a much shorter and smaller sequence of RNA. And since it has a different sequence, that RNA most likely has a different function within the cell. And certainly the protein that is, that is produced from this RNA versus the protein that would be produced if you kept one of these particular alternative uh, introns within the RNA the intron is basically the region that gets cut out, and the exon, exons are the regions that always stay in. If you kept one of these introns, if you kept one of these regions within the RNA, the protein that you would get would be very different because you have all of the particular base pairs and all of the particular nucleotides that are associated with all of these building blocks, these so-called amino acids, that form proteins, all of these extra amino acids are stuck onto the protein that you're creating. So if you have a different protein, it has a different shape, it'll also have a different function. So alternative splicing, as is seen here, is another way of generating diverse products within the cell. And this is copied directly from the UCSC genome browser as is shown, CHAT has many different possible splice variants, each of which can have their own possible function. The last takeaway from this particular presentation is that we can basically take the simplified schematic that I've been presenting, try and understand the same thing within the context of real biological visualization programs, bioinformatics visualization programs that scientists use every day, and then begin to interpret data as we see it. And so up top here is basically within the integrated genomics viewer, the IGV viewer. This is what we'll be exploring and looking at a little bit further with examples. This is, at top, the reference sequence, shown here with the chromosomes and shown here with coordinate information. So, for example, there's the chromosome, this sort of structure, this organization. How do we find a location? Well, there's the chromosome and then the actual coordinate on the chromosome. We have then, in the middle, all of the reads or the data the RNAs that we're looking at, each one of these particular gray boxes is a sequence of RNA that has been aligned, basically put on top and compared to the reference sequence to figure out where it might have come from within the human genome. So we have all of this RNA, and then we have the reference. This is from a database called RefSeq. But the reference basically describes what is known about this locus. So as shown on the previous slide, all of these, these are also from the reference, all of these pieces of, all of these pieces of RNA, so-called, this is basically what is canonical. So if you were to, for example, look up the definition of a word in the dictionary, it would give you a certain definition. If you look up the definition of chat, you get this image. It says chat has one, two, three, four, five, six splice variants. They are shown here within the genome, and we know that they exist. All of this, these RNAs, all of these RNA reads, well, they're part of, let's say, a new data set, or this is a new analysis. So none of these have entered the canonical literature. The canonical literature is summarized below, and it says that this particular gene, 
Link 173, has two splice variants, as shown. So what we can do is look at our reads, our novel data. We can look at the dictionary, and we can compare the two. And what, if you look at this for a while, you'll probably notice that there are some discrepancies. I'm going to highlight one particular one right here, and then I suggest that you spend some more time looking at this particular diagram and see if you can spot any more. But within these two reads, highlighted in red and blue respectively, there are there is a particular exon here, a particular region of RNA that ends at this defined point. And if we follow along this particular point within the graph, this particular base pair, and we look at the reference, we see that there is no splice variant that shares this same signal, this same termination signal, this same junction, the same intron, all the way to the end here. And so since there are no other splice variants in the dictionary definition that share this really large intron that, these, that both of these two reads possess, we can hypothesize that this is a novel RNA, a novel transcript variant that is not a part of the dictionary definition. And indeed, that's what makes this kind of research novel and exciting. Thank you very much.